The proceeding will start shortly. 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 The 
The proceeding will start shortly. 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 Uh, I'm chairing the first half an hour of this debate, and then I will be joining you in the main body. Uh, and Mr. Robertson will be taking over from me in half an hour's time. 
Uh, members should sanitise their microphones before and after they use them. Those are the instructions. Uh, members should only speak from the horseshoe. And uh, members are not expected to remind for the wind-ups, but if they could stay perhaps for the uh, following one or two speeches after they've spoken. There are 19 people on the call list, including myself. Now, they're not all here at the moment, and one person who was going to be late has arrived here now. And uh, one person has withdrawn, so we've got 18 people. But if we're to get everyone in, and I know the front bench spokespeople have, will cooperate, I would think it's going to be about three minutes or four minutes at the most. Order, order. Tom Hunt to move the motion. Here. I beg to move that this House has considered e-petitions 244530 and 300071 relating to pet theft. It's an absolute honour to serve under your chairmanship. Um, I want to start by congratulating Dr Daniel Allen, the animal geographer from Keele University, who started both pet theft petitions uh, with over 100,000 signatures we're here to debate today. I met virtually with Dr Allen. Uh, and a number of other campaigners from a stolen and missing pets alliance back in June when these debates weren't possible. I know how much work they have done over the years to raise awareness of pet theft and also help reunite victims with their stolen pets. And I'm pleased that pet theft reform has eventually got the debate it deserves today. I also want to thank the over 117,000 people who signed the 2019 petition calling for tougher sentencing for pet theft and the over 143,000 people who signed the second petition in 2020 including the 417 people in my constituency of Ipswich, is thanks to their engagement with our democratic process that we are debating this important issue today. I also want to thank the Honourable Member for Stroud, who couldn't be here today but has worked with me on this campaign, and also the Honourable Members like the Honourable Member for Dartford, who has been a key, very active on this issue over a number of years. What I think all the signatories of this petition recognise, and what I will argue today, is that currently pet theft just isn't treated with the seriousness it deserves in our society, and reform is urgently needed. Pet theft is a sickening and depraved crime. I think of those with pets or who have had them can only those who have had pets or those with pets or all who have had them can only imagine the sense of loss, anger, and hopelessness we would feel if they were snatched away from us in such a cruel in such cruel circumstances, not knowing whether they are encountering abuse, being used for inhumane breeding practices or exploited for illegal fighting in the case of dogs. In some ways, this must, must feel worse than when, when they simply pass away. We love our pets in this country. They're our companions through thick and thin. They're a unique source of friendship, and they're irreplaceable members of a family in so many households. Yet when it comes to them being stolen, in the vast majority of cases, our pets are treated no differently under a theft act from replaceable and inanimate objects like mobile phones and laptops. The primary focus in the law on monetary worth means that pets deemed to be worth less than £500 can only be classed as a Category 3 or 4 offence. This is what results in pitiful fines, often no more than £250, being the normal punishment for pet thieves. And of course, even these meagre fines only apply if criminals are brought to justice. The data Dr Allen has compiled from a Freedom of Information request shows that in 2009, only 19 dog vet crimes resulted in charges out of a total of 1,575 crimes in the police force areas we have data for. That's just over 1%. In the overwhelming majority of cases, there is no justice at all. With the likelihood of such weak sentences being a result of a successful investigation, the police simply don't have the right incentives to put stretched resources into bringing these criminals to justice. This status quo doesn't reflect the place pets have in modern society and that they're invaluable members of the family. Unlike a mobile phone or laptop, the monetary value of our pets is what we care about the least. And this is why you'll often see many heartbroken victims post rewards for a return of their pet many times higher than their pet's nominal monetary value. Criminals know the status quo is ripe for exploitation and this has left us unguarded against the surging cases we have seen over lockdown, as more and more people want the companionships that pet pets offer. Just 25 out of 44 police sources have provided FOI data on dog theft um, for January to July this year, but already the figure stands at 645 
dog theft crime committed with only two resulting in charges. In my own county of Suffolk, there were 11 dog theft crimes in the whole of 2019, but just in the first seven months of this year, that number has already doubled to 21. Dr Allen's collated data, which includes FOI responses to Ben Parker of BBC Suffolk, also shows that Avon and Somerset, Devon and Cornwall, North Yorkshire and Northamptonshire have had more dog theft crimes in the first seven months of 2020 than the whole of last year. We must also remember that one dog theft crime doesn't mean... One, we also must remember that one dog theft crime doesn't mean one dog stolen. Shocking cases like the theft of 17 dogs and puppies from boarding kennels and Barton Mills in Suffolk in July will only be recorded as a single crime. Our pets are being snatched away from us in record numbers this year, just when we need their companionship the most. Lockdown has a, pe a period of loneliness and isolation for many, and it's taken its toll on everyone's mental health. But for so many people, their pets have been a constant course of, a source of company. At the height of lockdown, I set up a, a service called Talks with Tom, where any constituent could have a phone call with me if they felt they needed to have someone to have a chat with. I'll never forget one older gentleman who called me. He was living alone after his wife had sadly passed away. His wife had a cat, which was very much her cat, and which he never really got on with. And when she died, he reluctantly inherited the pet, which had never shown him much affection whatsoever. But he told me how it was during lockdown that he and his cat had grown to become inseparable and the closest of friends during difficult times. There will be heartwarming stories about how our pets have kept us going through lockdown all across the country. But the unprecedented times we are living through take the increasing number of stories about pets being snatched away all and more harrowing as well. This weekend I spoke to Katie Ellen from Maple Cross in Hertfordshire, who is a mother of 10-year-old George. Their dog, Trigger, a beautiful black and white English Springer Spaniel, had been a present for George when he was nine. George calls Trigger his brother, and Trigger kept George company on long adventures through the woods during lockdown. But on the 21st of August, Trigger was lured out of the back door of their home and stolen from them. Understandably, this has left his family distraught in a way that can't be compared to if a thief had simply walked into a back and taken a phone off the side of the kitchen counter. Katie Allen said something very telling when she said that taking, the taking of George's brother felt more like a kidnapping than a theft. And how she hasn't been able to get it, get it out of her mind and she wakes up thinking about it. I also spoke to a gentleman called John Gaunt, who is a gamekeeper at Brightling Park in Sussex. In his job, John spends 90% of his time working in a park alone, except from three sp Springer Spaniels. Poppy, Tilly and Pepper. He describes his dogs as living, breathing sources of company and affection. But on the 14th of May, he felt like he had had his legs taken out from underneath him when he went into their kennels and found them gone. And he's since been on a roller coaster of emotions. He's got Poppy back and is trying to claim Tilly, who is in a police pound, but Pepper remains missing. And John told me just how gut-wrenching it is when his young granddaughter still asked, where is Pepper? The thieves who took John's dogs used sophisticated equipment to get into the dog's locked kennel, and we should be under no illusions that it's organised crime groups who are planning and ruthlessly executing the thefts, thefts of our cherished pets. They know the money that they can make made from breeding pedigrees and selling puppies for a quick profit, yet we're fighting this growing tide without dated and underpowered laws. The risk of small fines will not stop this type of organised crime. In conclusion, that's why we must have pet form reformed. We must have pet theft reformed. Making pet theft a specific offence, as these petitions call for, would elevate pet theft to a Category 2 offence and empower judges to hand out prison sentences of up to two years. Sentences which represent something closer to justice and an effective deterrent against this disgusting crime. I know the government has said in its, its written response to these petitions that the maximum penalty is already seven years and therefore reform isn't needed. But I challenge anyone to find a case where the maximum sentence has been imposed. These sentences are only available in Crown Courts, but a significant majority of cases stay in Magistrates' Courts, where the maximum prison sentence is just six months. I also appreciate that the Sentencing Council's guidelines take into account the emotional distress caused to victims. But the truth is that as long as the monetary worth of a pet is a primary factor for deciding the category of offence, the weight of a judge can apply to emotional distress in sentencing is severely restricted. 
Change from the law should be our goal, but given that we've seen over the last few months, we must act now. Last week, I met with my right honourable friend, the Lord Chancellor, and John Cooper QC, who is providing legal advice to the Pet Thefts Reform Campaign, to discuss how the Sentencing Council could amend their guidelines to make specific mention of pet theft. This would give judges the tools they need to take into account, to a far greater ex extent, the aggravating factors in pet theft cases and to oppose other prison sentence without having to change the law. I want to thank the Secretary of State for taking this, for taking this meeting and I hope you will consider writing to the Sentence Council recommending that these changes are made. COVID-19 has made pet theft reform more pressing, not less. less. And I promise campaigners in our virtual meeting in the summer I'll try and get this debate as soon as possible. There's been so much heartbreak during the pandemic, but we have an opportunity now to stop the theft of our beloved pets, continuing to be part of it. They deserve our protection, and so do victims. And I'd urge the government to hear these petitioners and families all across the country who are demanding justice. Our pets, Mr Chairman, have always, they're always there for us. And during this pandemic, they've been there for us more than ever. Now is the time to be there for them. Thank you very much, Mr Chair. The question is that this House has considered e-petitions 244530 and 300071 relating to pet theft. If all colleagues speak for between four and five minutes, then everyone will be called. Mr Jim Shannon. Thank you, Sir David. First of all, can I say what a pleasure it is to for all the honourable gentlemen for a switch. Him and I have many things in common. Maybe we don't agree on everything, but one, one thing we do agree on is that Swedish football team. Now, that's my son's football team, so therefore, whenever I follow the scores on a Saturday, I'm able to relate to the honourable member, as I did today, and we had a conversation. He then tells me the day he's actually a Newcastle supporter, but I, I think they're the second team, but that's by the way, you know. But it's, it's really nice, uh, Sir David, to, to speak in this debate, and thank you. During my time in isolation, or, or in self-isolation as it was, my faithful companion was Autumn, a Springer Spaniel. Uh, and when we are out in the garden walks, she faithfully joined me. In fact, she has been faithful her, her whole life. That dog in particular, Sir David, was a, was a dog that came from a... Uh, I think someone had been very, very bad to it. And, very, and, we, and we, we, we actually rescued the dog from a, from, from a, from a CC. Uh, and and we, as a dog we now have in our house. There's a saying that dog is man's best friend. But you, Sir David, and I both know that the Lord Jesus is our best friend. He sticks closer than a brother. But Autumn, that dog... Uh, definitely comes in a close second. This matter is so pertinent uh, as a theft of dogs, especially given gun dogs and shooting dogs in particular has risen dramatically. I can understand the heartache that comes from losing that faithful friend who loves regardless and will always be happy to see you, no matter how burdened and low you feel. I understand the facts that are not uh, feeling that it's hard to put a value in the friendship of the dog, but to have the legal principle which restricts judges from imposing a fine greater than the monetary amount paid for the dog truly does, I believe, a disservice. Currently, in the eyes of the law, dogs are treated like any other form of property, and so the punishment for dog theft is determined by the monetary value of the dog. As such, paltry fines are mostly given. Uh, and I do put on record, uh, um, Sir David, our, my, my position in relation to Northern Ireland, and, 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 the, and as they did put down the microchipping, and I see that's now maybe is going to uh, move across the rest of the UK as well. Especially in those horrific cases where dogs are stolen to participate in dog fights, and your pampered pooch. Reared to be so gentle and loving as thrown into a ring for bets. Even saying, saying this makes me feel sick to my stomach. To allow fines, which will say, no papers to prove pedigree, so worth only about £50. Uh, what's the value of your dog? Not more than £50 for me, anyway. Adds insult to stomach churning injury. This is why I wholeheartedly support the dog's trust in their calls for the Sentencing Council to amend existing guidelines to ensure that all cases of companion theft are considered a Category 1 or Category 2 crime as a minimum, regardless of monetary value. I further support their, their request to see accurate and consistent recording and reporting of incidents to the theft of a companion animal. Dogs Trust has long been called for increased penalties for animal cruelty offences and strongly support a bill which will increase the maximum uh, sentence for animal cruelty offences from six months to five years. That's the sort of uh, uh, legislation I want to see in place. Address and protect the prey as, as some dogs may spend in kennels during a court case and introduce a way of expediting the process or allowing the rehoming of seized animals. Introduce an automatic ban on, on owning animals if a person is convicted of an animal cruelty offence, not only as a preventative measure to ensure that person commits no further offences, but to serve as an extra deterrent and better protect animal welfare. They say, Sir David, that, that, that those who treat animals 
badly and mischievously and violently and cruelly are, are, they're, they're, they're on a path to no, no, no good. Let me be clear, sensing will never bring a, a beloved animal home to where it was completely loved, but it will allow someone who is grieving to feel that the loss is somewhat understood. It will also act as a deterrent when people understand that it is not the thought share, it's only an old dog, they will know that they will be taken seriously and the consequences of their despicable actions will be heavy indeed. When I think of so many of our elderly whose companions provide such love and affection and company, especially in these days of, of, of isolation, there can be no doubt in the mind of any criminal that this is a serious matter. And we want to do that today. And it's up to this House, and I have to say, up to the Minister as well. And we look forward to her, her response to our request. Thank you. Mrs Cheryl Thank you very much, uh, Sir David. And it's a pleasure to speak under your chairmanship. And I know how committed you are to all parliamentary pets, having organised the Parliamentary Pet of the Year competition. I was lucky enough to meet your dogs at the time, and I know you saw some lovely photographs of my bosun. Um, I'd also like to congratulate the Honourable Member for Ipswich for securing this debate, because it is really important. And I want to concentrate on a manifesto pledge that I, the Conservative Party, and to be fair, the Labour Party, um, made at the last election, which was to seek compulsory microchipping of cats. As the co-chairman of the all-party parliamentary group for cats and as the proud owner of two VIPs, that's very important pets, I feel that it's time to bring the right regulations to require the compulsory micro microchipping of owned cats. I had Millie microchipped and the newest addition to the Murray-Davidson household is Louis who came from the cat's protection. Little Louis's former owner had poor health and so he needed a new home and came chipped because the cat's protection believed that cats should be microchipped. So, where possible, cats can be reunited with their owners. I agree and I thank them for all their help to cats everywhere. Unfortunately, I have to report that in recent years, cat theft is, growing, is a growing problem, including in my local Devon and Cornwall area. A microchip increases the chance of a pet, that a pet will end up back with their rightful owner. Although, how one of my constituents pointed out to me this morning, it does you have to ensure that all the details on the register are up to date. And I urge the Minister to perhaps make it compulsory for when vets see these pets to update the details of the owners. Because this can often resolve any dispute um, which, without the need for litigation. I understand from the Secretary of State that responses to the call for evidence on cat microchipping, which closed on the 4th of January, has been held up due to COVID-19. Whilst I understand this, is, this, is, I, this, I also call for all possible speed to be made because during lockdown people have so much more reliance, as has been mentioned, on their pets for company. My own mother-in-law, who lives in Wales, often only has her pet Jess for company. We Zoom as much as we can, but it's Jess who's been there for her as a constant companion in the COVID world. Jess means so much to the whole family. That's why I was pleased that the Secretary of State has reported that the government is moving the situation along in the next three months with a consultation, and I ask the Minister to give us an update, and I also ask for an update on when we can see legislation coming to Parliament. There's no doubt that the compulsory microchipping of dogs, which came in in 2016, has worked, but I believe it can be improved um, through the ownership details being updated. And I also believe it's now time for cats to be treated equally in the eyes of the law, that this can massively help when it comes to the prosecuting and proving pet theft. Thank you very much, Mr Amos. John Lamont. Uh, thank you, um, Sir David. It's a pleasure to serve under your um, chairmanship and indeed to be speaking again uh, back in Westminster Hall. So, privilege to uh, follow my um, honourable friend for um, South East Cornwall and I pay tribute to my um, honourable friend for Ipswich for his um, opening remarks as well. 
Um, Sir David, who's not in the chair, um, I'm, I'm, I'm here today to um, participate in this debate as unusually um, the highest number of signatures on petition 244530 came from my constituency of Berwickshire, Roxburgh and Selkirk in the Scottish borders. Indeed, my honourable friends in neighbouring constituencies, the members for uh, Berwick upon Tweed and Lucretia, Clydesdale and Tweeddale, also had a high number of constituents signing this particular petition. It would seem that rural dwellers of the borderlands have a deep love of our pets and who can blame us. Now, being an elected member, either in this place or in the Scottish Parliament for over 13 years and travelling now to London every week, it would not be fair for a pet to be left at my home in Coldstream. Indeed, I'm sure most of my friends would say that I struggle to look after myself, never mind a pet. However, being the son of a farmer, I grew up with animals and pets all around. Indeed, I'm a big fan of my parents' dog, Hector, and understand the delights that having a pet at home can bring. Now, as other members have um, alluded to, um, our pets are even more um, integral to our lives. During this pandemic, our dogs and cats have been our much-needed companions and a much-needed source of perspective on things going on around us. I fully understand the attachment we all have with our pets and the important part they play in our family lives. They provide comfort, laughter and fun, and their energy and friendship are solely missed when they are gone. I fully understand the calls for making the theft of a living, breathing, sentient being a separate criminal offence. But before I go further, I would like to pay tribute to Georgie Bell in my constituency. Almost two years ago, her family's two border terriers, Ruby and Beetle, disappeared from their home near Jebra. Her campaign to find her dogs and a change in the law on duck dog theft reached the local and national press. She knows the heartbreak and emotional trauma that losing your pet can cause. The Facebook page set up to help find Ruby and Beetle has over 16,000 members and was a keen advocate of this petition, perhaps explaining the huge support from the borders and the surrounding areas. Now, in the short time I have left, I would like just to raise a particular issue um, with the Minister, um, which I think is relevant to this debate. Mandatory microchipping has been a very welcome step forward. I understand the law is now consistent across um, all parts of the United Kingdom. However, the case which I raised earlier of Ruby and Beetle shows flaws in the system. The microchips of one of the dogs has been run several times since going missing, yet the owners have no access to who or where this has been done. The reasons for this are apparently because of data protection. Yet it would seem to me that this would provide a potential lead to the stolen pet's whereabouts. This issue has been raised um, this year by the BBC's Rip Off Britain, and I would be very grateful if the Minister could consider this um, further. Finally, I would just like um, once again to thank the Bell family from Jebra um, for their campaigning on this issue, as well as those in my constituency who have signed this important petition. My thanks also go to the Petitions um, Committee and the Honourable Member for Ipswich for bringing this to Westminster Hall today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. It's a pleasure to, to speak under your chairmanship. Um, I'm so pleased to have the opportunity to speak in this debate this afternoon because this is such an important issue to me personally as well to many millions of pet lovers in the UK. I'm proud that this government is making significant progress on animal welfare, seeking to clamp down on puppy farms, puppy smuggling, legislating on microchipping, and also on Friday, I'm looking forward to speaking in the animal welfare sentencing bill um, known as Finn's Law Part 2. I think these are really valuable um, bills. I do trust that the government takes animal welfare very seriously, and I know how many animal lovers there are in the current government. However, I would like to urge the government to rethink the current laws on sentencing for pet theft. It is a growing crime, and I feel the law must be improved to reflect the seriousness of the crime and the impact on pet owners of having their pets stolen. Um, in lockdown, as the demand for pets has risen, so has the price for certain breeds of dogs and cats. Puppies and kittens are now big business, and as the price of those pets increases, so do the potential rewards for criminals. With every crime, there is a balance of risk and reward, and by sentencing, by hard sentencing, we have to deter these people from pet theft. We've heard from the Honourable Member for Ipswich that only 1% of <coughs> pet thefts come to prosecution at the moment. This is clearly a failure for pet owners. Um, 
criminals must believe they will be caught, they'll be sentenced, and they will be punished at a level that would deter other people from doing that. The maximum penalty is seven years imprisonment, which does sound appropriate and it does sound like a deterrent. But as we've heard today, most pet death cases stay in magistrates' courts and it is extremely unlikely anyone would face significant uh, custodial sentence for pet theft. The main point I want to focus on today is the penalty is linked to the value of the pet. Um, and I think we've, we've heard that under £500, the recommendation would be a Category 3 or 4 theft. Um, and at this point, I'm going to declare my own interest. My two Cavalier King Charles Spaniels, Cromwell and Bertie, have little, if any, financial value. They're eight years old. They're clapped out. One's got horrific <laughs> dental issues. The other one has a significant heart murmur. If anything, they are a financial liability. But to me, without a shadow of a doubt, they are the most valuable thing in the world. And if given a trade-off between all my worldly goods and my two dogs, I think I, like many pet owners, would not hesitate for a moment. While the financial value is still considered, we are not going to see fairness in sentencing. Why should someone that steals my pet face a far less harsh, less harsh sentence than someone stealing a designer puppy um, that the law decides is worth £3,000 versus my no money at all. Um, so in summing up, I thank everyone that signed the petition to look again at pet theft sentencing. I think it's really, really important. It's common sense. People want to see that fairness. And I support this petition. Thank you, uh, Mr. Robertson. Um, Mr. Robertson, I think everyone in this room would agree that this is a particularly nasty offence. It's incredibly stressful, uh, both for the owner and uh, for the dog itself, uh, when a dog is stolen. And uh, the problem, I think, emanates from the Sentencing Council guidelines, much has been mentioned, on Honourable Friend from Ipswich as, uh, as well, as uh, the previous speaker spoke about the Sentencing Council guidelines, which are insufficient. Back in 2016, I wrote to the Sentencing Council uh, and asked them to change the guidelines so that there was less emphasis placed on the value of the actual piece of property that was stolen, in this case an animal. And they came back to me and said, no, the current guidelines were perfectly acceptable and even made mention of the fact that pedigree dogs are very often worth more than £500 and therefore there wasn't any necessity to change the guidelines. And that misses the whole point of this particular crime, as been mentioned before. Uh, I have a golden retriever that's worth probably less than 50 <laughs> pence, uh, a 12-year-old <laughs> golden retriever called Fred, uh, um, that, that, that is, is definitely not worth stealing. Um, however, again, it misses the point. It's a family, member of the family that's being stolen, and that's why uh, we see so many sort of tears from people that uh, have gone through this you know, rather awful experience uh, and why these animals are stolen is simply because it is a low risk high reward type of crime if you know that you're not likely to be sent to prison because the value of the dog is less than 500 pounds well then that's a very attractive crime to commit and this is why we're unfortunately seeing an increasing number of people carrying out this uh, offense that was happening before lockdown and it, the numbers have shot up since lockdown because the value of dogs uh, have gone up and therefore there's even greater reward for still the same low risk for people to carry out uh, these uh, dastardly offences. Um, what I'd also say, Mr Robertson, is that if, if the Sentencing Council are so stubborn that they will not change their guidelines, then there is a way of Parliament stepping in and actually making a specific offence uh, of stealing a, an animal, which I believe this petition alludes to. Um, if we were to do that, then that would give the court separate powers in order to give the sort of sentences that we all want to see for this kind of crime. Unfortunately, you know, we don't have a specific offence for this. We have a, a specific offence of stealing a pedal cycle, but not of stealing a member of your family. That cannot be right, and therefore the Sentencing Council needs to reconsider this. And, and I, I pay tribute to the work of the stolen... Missing, um, Solar Missing Pets Alliance, uh, who have done some tremendous things in highlighting 
uh, this particular crime, and particularly Debbie Matthews, who's worked tirelessly to try and bring about a change in, in the rules. I also pay tribute to Kent Police, who are one of the forces actually around the country who take this seriously, because with so many parts of the country, when the police are called to a dog that's been stolen, it's simply recorded as missing when the owner knows it's been stolen. And consequently, you're seeing lower official figures for the theft of a dog than is actually the case. And when a dog is actually recorded as stolen, it's put in as a theft of a chattel. And, and therefore, it's very difficult to get facts and figures on how courts are actually sentencing people for these offences. So we have to go on anecdotal and experience uh, examples to actually try to get to the bottom of what's actually taking place. So there are some good things going on out there. We need more to be done about this. I urge the Minister to use her good offices to persuade the Sentencing Council, if we can. I'm pleased that this is, a, I think, a cross-party uh, interest as well. You know, I'm pleased that we're one on this particular issue. So hopefully, collectively, we can either get the Sentencing Council to see sense or this place needs to actually take action and bring in a specific offence of dog theft. Thank you, Mr Robertson. I'd like to thank all of the people who signed the petition and the Honourable Member for Ipswich for bringing forward the, this debate on this very important issue today. It's an issue that's of great personal and emotional significance to so many people that I represent. The increasing incidence of pet theft caused huge distress and trauma across our pet-loving nation, with numbers soaring in recent months. The Dog Lost Organisation suggests 2020 will be the worst year for the theft of dogs. Pet theft is increasing across the country. Horrific incidents of people being attacked and dogs stolen in front of their eyes. Burglaries are committed purely to steal pets. Owners left to hope for the best, knowing that their pets could be sold on, used in horrific dog fighting, and in some cases used for breeding in cruel and dirty puppy farms. I've heard the stories of heartbroken constituents who can sometimes spend weeks and months looking for their pets in the hope they've been lost and will return, sleepless nights at the loss of their furry friend and the thought of what might have happened to them. To many, their pets can be part of the family, lifetime companions, there as company, making memories in the good times, but also there in our hour of need. The, pandem the pandemic has made many appreciate this company even more so, spending more time at the local park or in front of the television. My mother has four sons, and if faced with the choice between having one of us or Archie, her beloved, her beloved Bichon freeze stolen, I'm not entirely confident which she'd opt for, uh, and I don't think he's worth much either. Uh, it is without doubt that pets and their owners can have a priceless relationship that is beyond any monetary value. It's for that reason that the law must reflect non-monetary value of pets. After all, when worse comes to a worse, a stereo TV or bicycle can be replaced. Many of our pets are entirely irreplaceable. The punishment of pet theft must reflect the pain and suffering caused by such a heinous act, the emotional impact of losing a loved one. It must also act as a deterrent to those who would consider doing such an awful thing. I support this petition entirely and urge the government to review its approach to the theft of pets, acknowledging their unique value in this nation of pet lovers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Robertson. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship today. If I have my phone or wallet or car stolen, they are insured and can be replaced virtually on a like-for-like -like basis. It would be frustrating, inconvenient. I would be angry and annoyed. And naturally, I would want the thief to face the full force of the law. However, if Clemmy, my nine-year-old Jack Russell, Peppy, my seven-year-old Labrador, or Ebony, my four-year-old Labrador, were stolen, they could not be replaced. They are an integral part of my family, individual in character, each providing a unique and special companionship to me and members of my family. I congratulate my honourable friend, the member for Ipswich, on bringing today's debate. And I'm pleased that the Petitions Committee have given us time to debate this topic that affects so many of our constituents. Between these two petitions, almost 500 signatures came from my constituency of Darlington and I thank those constituents who took time to voice their concerns. I know too how many more of my constituents are dog owners and who, like me, consider their four-legged friends to be part of their family. Under current legislation, the theft of a pet is already a criminal offence under the Theft Act, with a maximum penalty of seven years imprisonment. However, we know too that only one in five 
are ever returned to their owner. With over 2,000 dogs stolen every year, there remain over 1,600 families who lose that member, never to be seen again. It is a tragic, and we should do more. Whilst my canines collectively cost less than 800 quid to purchase, they have cost me significantly more in damage to property, food, and vet's bills. Sadly, not one of them under the law would be deemed of sufficient value to warrant anything nearing a custodial sentence were any one of them stolen. Sentencing is about punishment and rehabilitation, but is also about setting a deterrent. With a low intrinsic value, insufficient to warrant investigation, and four out of five dogs that are stolen never being recovered, the despicable people responsible for dog theft sadly know that their chances of A, being caught, or B, suffering a punishment, is very low. I welcome the mandatory microchipping we now have. This has clearly helped more pets be reunited and serves in the armory of deterrents and has thankfully reduced the number of stray dogs on our streets. I also welcome the recommendation for vets to carry out routine scanning for new pets enrolled at their practices. These measures for dogs are something that we as a nation should also be extending to cats too. And I concur with my honourable friend for South East Cornwall in getting mandatory chipping done for cats. <coughs> I believe, and the pet owners of Darlington believe, the theft of a pet is much more damaging than the loss of an item of financial value. I believe that a specific offence of pet theft, or at the very least, specific sentencing guidance based on more than the purchase cost of the animal will do much more to deter this dreadful crime. Craig Williams. Thank you, Mr. Robertson. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And can I echo uh, the compliments given by other members to the Honourable Member for Oatswich and the way he conducted the opening of this debate and equally to the Petitions Committee for recommending this these petitions for debate, over 100,000 signatures, I think shows better than I can today the strength of feeling about strengthening the law around this. I also want to pay tribute to Dr. Allen, of course, and the, and the campaign group, but also to the Kennel Club and the Dogs Trust. It will, I'm sure, surprise no members around the room that when the Dogs Trust uh, put together a survey, they found 99% of uh, respondents considered their pets to be a family member. I declare my interest, Mr. Robertson, Winston, my Welsh Springer Spaniel. I think Springer Spaniel seems to be a theme around the room today. Clearly, their dog's trust should do some research into parliamentarians and their Springer Spaniels. Uh, but he, of course, is a, a, a member of the family. And the, it goes to the root, I think, of the problem in the sentencing about the monetary value. I think if anyone was to put a business case together for getting a pet, they probably wouldn't. Uh, and that goes to the heart of you cannot treat the kind of sentencing we're talking today in terms of monetary value, that straight away moves most of these crimes to classes three and four, which clearly are suboptimal for sentencing in this regard. I know that if uh, anyone should dare to, to, to take my dear Winston, our Welsh Springer Spaniel, I would want, of course, it to go immediately to category one, as I value him personally. I don't know about other members and their dog, way over 10,000 pounds. Uh, and, and that is at the heart of this, Mr. Robinson. I, I look forward to the Minister's retort to this important debate, but I know that the good constituents of Montgomeryshire think the law is currently suboptimal. I know my constituents, and it was a pleasure, Mr. Robinson, to email out to my constituents today and say I'm talking about pet theft and to receive more emails about pet theft than Brexit and COVID-19 in a day. It was a great pleasure to read my inbox today. Uh, but there is a huge strength of feeling that at the moment the law simply isn't working for pet owners. There is a huge sense of feeling in Montgomeryshire and rural Wales that they are starting to fear for their pets. And as Wales is locked down today by our wonderful Welsh Government, people are looking for comfort and people across Montgomeryshire and Mid Wales will be looking to their pets for comfort. And the least we can do Mr. Robertson, the least I can do for Winston, my dear Welsh Springer Spaniel, the least I can do for my constituents and their pets is stand up today, Minister, and implore our government, who I know is looking hard in this regard, to look at specifically the monetary value to amend 
the Theft Act of 1968, to create, at the very least, a specific offence, a specific offence for the theft of pets, and to do our pets justice, and to give our constituents some heart that if the unthinkable should happen, and they were dog-napped, cat-napped, pet theft, it, there would be a sentence that warrants that offence. So, Mr Robinson, I will sit down, but I, I implore the Minister to do something about it. Dr Kieran Mullen. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. I want to begin also by thanking uh, the member for Ipswich for securing this debate. And I know he's a, he's a passionate supporter of animals. Uh, people across this country bring pets into their households. They love and care for them as if they're members of their family. We are a pet-loving nation. Sadly, despite the reported fall in pet theft in 2019, we've all talked today about the anecdotal evidence, the strong anecdotal evidence that this is shot up during lockdown. At least five dogs are stolen every day in England and Wales. That's five loved members of their family stolen from their homes. But to criminals, pets are money-making objects, and they can often be used and abused to make a profit. As others have mentioned, Dr Allen from Keele University has found that in 2018, only 1% of pet theft resulted in the fee getting charged. Dr Allen says that sadly criminals see pet theft as a low-risk, high-reward crime, and this should not be the case. Almost 600 of my constituents have signed one of the two petitions we are debating today, asking for something to be changed. Pets are loved members of the family who bring us so much joy and happiness, and we need to have an approach that recognises they are more than just property. We need to make it crystal clear to criminals that stealing a pet is a risky choice to make. I sympathise with the government's position in terms of reluctance around specific legislation, and what counts for me is the outcome, not how we get there. The government, in their written response to uh, this petition, have pointed out that theft is a of a pet is already a criminal offence under the Theft Act 1968 with a maximum penalty currently of seven years imprisonment. But all of us here, and the Minister in particular, are in the unfortunate position of not actually being able to say what's happening in reality on the ground. And so I think it's very hard for the government to defend the position and say this is satisfactory when actually others have put in written questions asking for what the average sentence is, asking to understand is the law working, and we're not recording those statistics. So I think the first thing I think the government has to do is tackle that. So whatever decisions are made today and in the near future, the government and us as scrutinisers are in a position to judge if the current approach is working. And so that, I think, is the first thing that the government needs to tackle. And then, at the very least, if it won't move on legislation, it does need to join with us in, in engaging with the Sentencing Council. Um, if, as is currently the case, uh, that there is an expectation that something with a value of less than £500 is stolen, that that person should only get community order, we've heard many examples today of pets that wouldn't meet that threshold. Uh, 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 and so I think that that is a bar that shouldn't exist and it's no surprise therefore that people are concerned that custody is not being given when it should. The government will point out that yes the guidelines do allow for additional weight to be given to uh, the emotional impact surrounding an offence but even when that is the case uh, the, the, the starting point then just becomes one year as a category three offence uh, so actually that in itself doesn't provide enough of a, of a solution. Uh, so uh, I think we need to make it very, very clear to criminals who snatch pets from loving families, families that they're committing a serious offence and that they will be punished accordingly. And we just don't know whether that's happening at the moment and we can't guarantee that it is. Uh, I think it would be appropriate to have a sentencing guideline that's specific to pet theft and ask judges to begin by thinking of this as a Category 2 offence uh, under the current, current legislation, irrespective of the monetary value of the pet, which currently acts as this important limiting factor. This does leave discretion, but it makes it clear to judges and the public, and importantly criminals, that stealing a pet is serious, it causes huge distress to families, and is something they should think very carefully about doing. Caroline Noakes. Thank you, Mr Robertson. It is, of course, a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship, and I would like to add my congratulations to my honourable friend, the member for Ipswich, for having uh, opened this debate, raising many of the points that I would have made had I had the opportunity to make a very long speech, which people will be relieved I do not. Over the course of the last few days, I have been contacted by many of my constituents in Romsey and Southampton North asking me to come and speak this afternoon. Interestingly, the vast majority of those emails came from one village, Werrell, one of the smallest villages in the Tess Valley. And that struck me as being slightly odd that such a disproportionate number came from one place. But there is a very good reason why that was. And although this afternoon we've heard many heartbreaking stories of Trigger, of Ruby, of Beetle, I would like to add the story of one more dog, this time a cocker spaniel, a small cocker spaniel called Cleo. Cleo was four years old when she was taken from her owner, Mr Rudd Clark, an 85-year-old gentleman who lives in Werrell. 
I hope he doesn't mind me mentioning that he's 85. <laughs> I did tell him I was going to speak this afternoon, but I didn't tell him I was going to say how old he was. Both Mr. Rudd Clark and his wife very much enjoyed the company of Cleo. She was the dog that got them out of the house to exercise in the fresh air in Hampshire, interestingly one of the most dog-friendly counties in the country. She's been their constant companion since she was a puppy. And she's a gorgeous blue roan, perhaps one of the prettiest dogs I've ever seen. And the reason that I've seen her is because Cleo has her own Facebook page and on pretty much every telegraph pole and tree in the village of Werrell is a picture of Cleo. Her owners had done the right thing. They'd made sure that she was microchipped and that the chip was registered to their current address. She was spayed. She wore a collar with her name and address on at all times. But she went missing on the 16th of September on her routine walk. She's believed to have been stolen because she simply vanished without a trace. And that's despite the villagers of Werrell being out with drones, with thermal imaging cameras, making appeals for dash cam footage. Indeed, there is an entire uh, community that has pulled together to try to find this dog. And we're all trying to make her disappearance as well known as we possibly can, hopefully making her too hot to handle. Cleo was the sort of dog that came to a whistle. I really do admire anybody who can make a cocker spaniel come to the whistle. I have certainly failed uh, in my attempts with my beloved dog, Alfie. But the assumption from the village, the owner and the police is that she was stolen. Indeed, as the charity Dog Lost concur. What a wicked and despicable crime to take a companion from an elderly gentleman. She was company, she was exercise, she was part of the family. And she'd been spayed, so her monetary value was much less because, of course, she couldn't be used for breeding purposes. We've heard this afternoon that, of course, stealing a pet in law is no different to any inanimate object. But they're not inanimate, and the trauma of losing a pet is absolutely horrific. There does need to be a decoupling from, for sentencing from the animal's value, because I know that the Minister is going to tell us that dog theft is already a crime under the Theft Act of 68, carrying a maximum penalty of seven years' imprisonment. But, of course, that sort of sentence is very, very rarely handed down. And I don't want to dwell on the reason why a dog might be stolen. Other members this afternoon have alluded to that. But the reasons are absolutely horrific. And they don't end up in the arms of a family that is going to love them in the same, one, in the same way that the one they have been ripped from does. So my honourable and indeed learned friend, the Minister, is a good minister. She is one who cares passionately about this issue. And I know that she has the power to do something. Today, she can give us a steer that DEFRA will seek to amend the Theft Act, which is over 50 years old, and bring it into line with how 21st century Britain and the village of Werrell feel about their pets. With thanks to the next speaker for covering the first part of this sitting, Sir David Amos. Well, I'm very embarrassed, Mr. Robertson, that at the start of the debate, I prevailed on colleagues to make short speeches. <laughs> They've been so brief now, there's going to be very long wind-ups, but I'll leave that to your chairmanship. I want to congratulate the Honourable Member for Ipswich on the way he presented the petition and commend him on the passion that he displayed right at the end of the speech. Absolutely splendid. And, of course, we are a nation of animal lovers, and I think uh, this meeting in Westminster Hall has displayed through our voices that we are a house of commons full of animal lovers, and I certainly uh, commend that. I've agreed with all the points which colleagues have made, and if I say to my honourable friend, the member for Dartford, I'm very um, appreciative of his, his constituent, Mrs uh, Debbie Matthews, the um, daughter of Bruce Forsyth, uh, my favourite comedian, for her briefing on, on, on this subject. Um, I very much agree that uh, animals are sentient beings uh, due to the science proving that they can experience pain, suffering, joy and comfort. However, by equating them to property, we are denying them the right to be sentient beings. The Theft Act 1968 does justice and I say to my honourable friend, the Minister, it is old legislation. Pep Theft was a problem before coronavirus. It has escalated during the lockdown period and may continue to do so un unless the government takes harsher actions on the criminals that colleagues have been talking about. Now, I believe, if I say to the Minister, that the public are sending uh, the government a strong message. Uh, let us not forget that this is the second pet theft debate and that there have been three consecutive successful pet 
theft reform petitions. DEFRA are currently reviewing the compulsory dog microchipping regulations, and I agree with what my honourable friend, the member for South East Cornwall, said about microchipping the cats. As well as reporting pet thefts, microchipping also helps return stolen pets. I mean, I, I, a number of colleagues have said how much their animals are worth. Well, we often look after one of my daughter's uh, French bulldogs, uh, which is worth an absolute fortune, and we tend to cover up her European um, association. I'm delighted to be sponsoring my honourable friend, the member for Romford's bill, which, amongst all other things, recognises the importance of microchipping pets. However, there needs to be a single complete database of microchip cats and dogs like there is for horses, and it needs to be compulsory microchips to be checked against that database at every first vet appointment. Debbie Matthews, who started the Vets Get Scanning has been a champion in this area for many years, and I certainly congratulate her. Pet theft is seldom investigated, and usually the only thefts that result in an investigation are those where dogs are stolen for puppy farming. That's quite wrong. Uh, and then we, we have reports of the ridiculous sentences where uh, horrendous cruelty and they just get suspended sentences, whereas for metal theft, people are sent to prison for 12 years. Absolutely ridiculous. So the government needs to amend the Theft Act 1968 and make pet theft a specific offence with custodial uh, sentences. Pets' monetary values, as other colleagues have said, are relatively small compared to luxury items which carry sentence of seven years as a Category 1 crime. The punishment doesn't fit the crime as the loss of an inanimate object compared to a pet is very, very different. And as my honourable friend, the member for Dartford, said, the Sentencing Council needs to amend the existing guidelines to ensure that all cases of companion animal theft are considered a Category 1 or 2 crime as a minimum, regardless of monetary value. And speeches. We need to leave two or three minutes at the end for Mr Hunt to respond. Dr Lisa Cameron. <coughs> Many thanks Mr Robertson and it's a privilege and pleasure to serve under your chairmanship today and I'd like to start by congratulating and thanking the Honourable Member for Ipswich for setting the scene um, in such a detailed manner and really uh, I suppose when at the start of the debate, um, showing us all right across party what an important issue this is, um, what consensus there is, not just in Parliament here, but also in terms of members of the public, and for setting the scene in terms of the impact that this has on the victims, um, not just the silent victims who are the pets themselves, of course, who are stolen and often meet horrendous ends, but the families who suffer the emotional and psychological impact of pet theft, um, something that I will uh, speak a bit more about uh, in a moment. Uh, so I think um, as chair of the all-party uh, dog advisory welfare group, um, it's, it's an honour to speak in this debate, but also um, it's one that I know, not just in my constituency, but because I receive letters and emails from constituents right across the United Kingdom to AppDog um, saying how important it is. It's hopefully one that the minister will know um, is also a priority for people right across the United Kingdom. And I often say to um, those who contact me um, when they say, oh, you know, which emails do you have most of um, for your constituency? And I say, well, it's animal welfare. Um, and, uh, you know, that is the case. And I don't think my constituency is any different to any other in that regard. So this is a priority. There's consensus amongst all of the parties and those who have spoken, I'm sure, in taking this forward in the most positive way. And I do beseech the Minister to look very, very seriously at it because we're here to serve the public. Um, that's our job as MPs. And we must take um, the public's priorities and uh, the wishes of the public forward. Um, um, 
there's been a great deal of work already undertaken um, you know, in, in these issues. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Daniel Allen, uh, Mark Abraham, uh, Beverly Cuddihy from Dogs Today, who covers this issue um, you know, uh, repeatedly and, and is such a, a, a dog um, welfare um, fan herself. The, the Kennel Club, Battersea, Cats Protection too, who have been in touch with me. And, and I thank the honourable member who mentioned um, a bit about you know, cats are also stolen and actually that is on the rise so it's something that we should take very very seriously the dogs trust rspca sspca and debbie matthews from vets get scanning so um, we know there are many many people who are out there working very hard on the front line to support those who experience um, the tragedy of pet theft but also who want to see that change in legislation that we've all spoken of today um, I declare my own little interest um, as uh, owner of uh, rescue dog Rossi, the French bulldog, who we think was probably um, puppy farmed. He has his tail docked and, and had some problems settling into the family at the start. Um, but, you know, is absolutely part of the family now. And if we were to lose Rossi, um, you know, it, it would be devastating, not just for myself, and my husband, although he does complain quite a bit about having to take him out long walks, especially as the winter months are approaching, but also for our children, <laughs> who are very, very attached. Um, and uh, I think, um, you know, it goes without saying that dogs should be treated as companions and family members, not just as property, and that that should be happening within the law. A survey found, in fact, that 99% of pet owners consider their pets to be family members. And there are really great benefits of owning a pet or a dog. Improved physical health by encouraging that exercise, which I do every day for my husband. Um, reduced risk of depression and loneliness. Dog owners over 65 also make 30% fewer visits to the doctor. So it's actually helping our NHS too. Um, but the, the loss of a dog or any pet can be particularly hard for those who have few others to turn to for companionship. And I think we know that those who have been in lockdown and isolated, perhaps those who have been shielding, have found great comfort in their pets. Um, and for anyone in that circumstance to have a pet stolen would uh, just be an absolute travesty. Um, so we need um, really as a House of Commons to act on these issues very quickly. A study involving in-depth interviews with dog owners who had experienced dog theft, in fact, found that 30% reported feelings of loss, grief or mourning, 48% described themselves as absolutely devastated, and 37% suffered severe psychological or physiological effects after the dog was stolen. So I think that shows that within the law, there has to be recognition of the impact on people and their families, that this is not similar to losing your mobile phone, a computer or a bike, as has been mentioned today by honourable members. Um, it's absolutely different um, and it requires to be recognised as such. Um, COVID-19 has in fact seen an increase in pet theft in 2020. So this makes this all the more crucial that we must act now. Um, Wayne May from Dogs Lost um, stated, I've been doing this for 30 years now and it's the worst ever year I've known. Um, people who steal um, dogs, pets, um, are, are doing so um, for malicious reasons. I, I do not believe for a minute they could possibly be doing it for the welfare of the pet or the family. And therefore, um, often um, we find that in research it's orchestrated, it's linked with criminal gangs, um, linked with dog fighting, as has already been mentioned today, um, or um, monetary value, uh, breeding, uh, puppy farming, um, and uh, making money from the dog um, or pet. So, uh, in my own constituency, a little dog was stolen um, as part of a, a, a robbery from a home for no other reason than maliciousness and um, taken and then thrown into a fountain in the middle of Glasgow, which is about 
50 miles from my constituency. Um, and luckily, a caring member of the public found uh, the dog and he was returned to his owner. However, I understand from research that only one in uh, five dogs um, tend to be uh, found and uh, recovered to the owners. So um, this is a crime that's often um, goes unpunished and those who are culpable are not brought to justice. Um, in fact, of the 44 police forces in England and Wales, 24 provided data on recorded dog theft crimes comparing 2019 with the first seven months of 2020. Five out of 24 police forces had more dog theft crimes in the seven months of January to July 2020 than the whole of 2019. And the number of dog theft crimes that have actually led to charges in 2015, only 4.15%. 2016, 3.35%, 2017, 2.16%, 2018, 1.11%, actually reducing there, although a very small base to start off with, and 2019, 1.21%. So currently, very, very little deterrent exists. Um, steps must be taken to change the law because of the impact that I mentioned, but also um, because currently it's a crime that basically goes unpunished for those who engage in it. So it has very little consequence. And when there are crimes of that nature, that's um, part of the issue in itself in that people feel they can engage without, um, without bearing uh, the force of the law upon them, without perhaps even the resources being put into um, seeking out the culprits. So I thank everybody who's spoken today for a very consensual uh, debate. I think uh, the Minister knows that there is the weight of public opinion and uh, opinion across the Commons on her to take this forward and, and I'm sure um, that she will be as dedicated to these animal welfare issues as the rest of us and I look uh, very much forward to hearing her comments in the summing up. Thank you. Paula. Thank you very much Mr Robertson uh, and first of all can I like to pay tribute to the member for Ipswich for um, uh, for introducing this debate with such verve. Uh, the member that he replaced also had a similar verve for uh, animals, and so there is something clearly in the way that they, uh, they, they uh, uh, elect people in Ipswich to make sure that you are animal friendly. I'd also like to put on record uh, thanks, uh, as has been mentioned, to the uh, researchers and those people who have been fighting so hard on this for so long. And it is an area that I'd like to return to, that the member for South End West uh, so ably and politely put it uh, when, uh, when uh, mentioning it to the Minister, that we have been here before. And no matter how good this debate has been, and indeed it has been a very good debate, it is not the quality of this debate, it is the pressure on the Minister to act that is the one we need to look at. I think we have all had this stated before, but it is true that the theft of a pet isn't a simple matter of theft of an item, nor should it be treated as such by the law. It's the callous and criminal removal of a family member. It's kidnapping. It is something that strikes at the very heart of that family unit. Pet theft is a tragedy that should be measured more in emotional distress than in economic loss. And this debate has touched on not just pet theft, but a number of the parallel issues around animal welfare and protection of our animals as well. And so it's touched on microchipping, uh, animal cruelty, criminal breeding, uh, puppy farming, the import and export of animals as well. And I think where we need to look at it is not just taking one item as a line item to look at what can be done, but to recognise that pet theft plays into a much bigger concern around the future and the welfare of our, of our animals uh, as well, uh, together. And that is, in respect, actually one of the opportunities that hasn't been spoken about in this debate so far. And that is of bringing together those bits of outstanding welfare legislation that we are still waiting for. And as the member for Wolverhampton uh, uh, hinted at in her remarks, uh, that there is enormous cross-party support for many of those items that are sitting in the to-do tray of ministers. Um, I think the approach that ministers have adopted especially since 2015, of parceling up animal welfare into smaller and smaller bills, smaller issues and dealing with them one by one, is a fantastic way of gaining headlines, but it doesn't deal with the comprehensive nature of some of those challenges. And I would encourage the Minister to look at whether uh, animal sentience, uh, animal sentencing, assuming there's not enough time 
uh, for the bill that the member spoke about uh, uh, that's going to be debated on Friday, which I hope there will be, as well as cat microchipping and the other issues to be wrapped up together in a flagship animal welfare bill that I think could be brought in the Queen's speech. And I think there would be enormous public support, not just in relation to this issue, but a whole host of other animal welfare concerns if that were the case as well. Now, a number of members have spoken very passionately in this debate, and uh, it is only appropriate that I mention some of those together, because it does tell a story about what is going on here. The, the member for Montgomeryshire, who's no longer in his place, talks about the law being suboptimal and the law not working. And I think that is a cross-party concern, which echoed right across this chamber in this debate. The reality of it, that was mentioned by the member for Darlington, is that only one in five uh, animals are returned, which means that there are enormous numbers of families that are without their pets uh, for uh, each and every year. And I think that figure is really important. But the member for Crewe and Nantwich uh, talks about the importance of the data. And I agree with him on this, that actually the, the stretched police resource uh, and the real pressure uh, on, on police means that in many cases the, these crimes are not being properly recorded as pet theft. They're animals going missing, or they're simply not recorded at all. And I think that is especially true of uh, certain age groups who don't want to be a burden, who don't want to bother the authorities, who may sit at home desperately worried about their animal, but won't want to uh, make an appeal or burden the police with that, with that. And I, I would say to all those people who have lost an animal, who are worried about an animal, to report it. Because there are currently animals in animal shelters up and down the country who are waiting to be reunited. And I think there is a really important part that we should be encouraging that so we can get the data, which the Honourable Member uh, mentioned, to make sure the, the work is being done properly. I think the, the Member for Stockton South uh, said that pets are priceless. And indeed, a number of, uh, of members today have spoken about the, the economic value of their own animals in, in respect of this. Well, a law that is based simply on the economic value of an animal will always discount and disregard the emotional value of, of that animal as well. And I think there is a bigger change in animal welfare legislation that is a theme that we've seen over the past decade or so, where we're recognising not just animals as, as little furry creatures, but recognising the role of animals within our families, role of animals within our society, and the values that we want to attach to those, uh, uh, to those animals being reflected in the legislation that governs them. And there has been a gap there. And I do think there is opportunities to close that gap uh, in relation uh, to this. I have to say to the uh, member for Romsey and Southampton North, uh, I think we all wish that Cleo uh, and the Village of Well uh, best of luck in their endeavours in relation to finding that animal. And it is good to see so many people feeling strongly about this. It has been mentioned that animal welfare is indeed a topic that is at the top of our inboxes. And when I explain that to people, there is an element of shock and surprise for the first instant reaction, saying, is it not Brexit? Is it not COVID-19? <laughs> and then you kind of realise that people love animals more than they love people sometimes. And so there's no surprise to me that animal welfare is at the top of our agenda. And that demands that the action is therefore follows it in that way. Because as has been hinted at by a number of members, including the member for Strangford, that when we're talking about the theft of an animal, we need to look at it not just in the moment of that animal being stolen, not just in the use of uh, of sophisticated machinery, as the member for Ipswich spoken about, about the, the theft of a number of animals, or the opportunist there, we need to think about what happens to that animal afterwards. Because I know that when you lose an animal, you don't think about the economic cost. You worry about what's happening to that animal at that point. You worry about, are they trapped somewhere? Can't they get out? Are they okay? Is there something you could do to safeguard and protect that animal? It is that worry and that concern that eats away, that psychological torture that the SNP uh, spokesperson spoke about in terms of what happens from the moment of loss that is so uh, cruel about this crime. Because it, it, is, it is torturous. It is a form of torture when we lose that animal along the way. And that, I think, is something that uh, needs to be properly reflected. These petitions, I think, are good petitions. Uh, and I think there is enormous opportunity to do something about it. Uh, because we know that the uh, animals, are, our pets, are not simply possessions in relation to this. Uh, Labour is very sympathetic to the need to do more to tackle pet theft, including looking at possible changes in the law that have been spoken about so passionately across this House uh, uh, today. And I think there is an opportunity for ministers to work with the campaigners here, because the reasons that have been spoken about as to why government has so far refused to act in relation to sentences already existing and the criminal uh, guidelines and sentencing guidelines aren't working. And I think there is a moment to look again 
at not just what are the words on the page of the guidelines, but how they're being implemented. And they're not being implemented in a way that I believe carries public confidence in this measure. And I think, I think there's an opportunity to change that. Um, I hope that uh, in animal, the animal sentencing bill, uh, that like this debate has been seen before many times, will get the proper attention on Friday in private members' bill. It's something that I would have, uh, I have indeed called on the government to adopt as a government bill to ensure it has enough time. And I would encourage to make, the minister to make sure that is the case. Um, my neighbour, uh, the uh, member for South East Cornwall, uh, spoke very passionately about the need to microchip cats. And indeed, uh, I think it was uh, uh, just before the last general election that uh, some of us were in this same room debating the need to microchip cats as well. That was a compelling case then. It remains a compelling case now. And I think the danger of many of these issues is that with the world in crisis, with a jobs crisis looming, with COVID-19 taking up a much of government bandwidth, how can we get animal welfare issues like this properly on the agenda? And I say to the Minister, wrapping them together in a comprehensive animal welfare law is one way of doing that. And I would encourage the Minister to include puppy smuggling as part of that. Because when we talk about puppy, puppy smuggling, we frequently talk about animals smuggled into the United Kingdom. But there's also a reverse trend as well. And that is especially being used at the moment to satisfy the demand of uh, people seeking to buy an animal during the lockdown. I've heard a number of times uh, during this debate about how animals are such, uh, pets are such an important part of a companionship, of part of the family. And we know that there has been a real increase in not only the value of animals during the lockdown, uh, Dachshunds, English Bulldogs, French Bulldogs, Pugs and Chow Chows in particular, uh, shooting up. I mean, the price of a Dachshund has uh, shot up by a whopping 89% since the start of lockdown. Now, that is a market that those people will prey on, that uh, an element of criminality will prey on in order to get there. And I would encourage the Minister to make sure that is taken into account uh, as well. Uh, Plymouth is no different to many of the places that have been mentioned so far today. And I think there is an enormous public concern that we don't uh, find ourselves here again in six months' time. So I would encourage the Minister in addressing the, the very valid and well-put concerns of members uh, in this debate to give a reassurance that all those hundreds of thousands of people, including the 500 people who signed the petition from across Plymouth, won't need to sign the same petition again in order to get another debate, in order to put the pressure on an, uh, a minister to uh, enact what I think is a very clear and obvious instruction from the public and indeed from this House that we want to see uh, pet theft taken more seriously. Thank you. Minister. Thank you. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship and indeed that of the Honourable Gentleman from South End West. Um, I would like to congratulate the member for Ipswich on this debate and indeed the Honourable Lady from Stroud who can't be with us today. I know she's worked hard in this area. And all of the campaigners who've worked so hard to bring us to where we are today. I think we should all recognise that there's a lot of heartbreak behind this debate as well, of course, as the happy memories we all have with our animals. Um, the government really understands how important pets are to the families who care for them and that this has nothing to do with their monetary value. I am the carer, I never say owner, the carer of Midnight, um, who did not have an unbeatable start in life around the back of the local chicken factory. He was a feral stray and he and his brother fitted on my palm when they arrived. He became the per minister, I'm proud to say, several years ago. And he's campaigning indeed at the moment for his re-election. Um, it, it's clear that Midnight has no monetary value whatsoever, but his value to me and my husband and my children is priceless. And we've heard today about a number of animals who are just like Midnight. We've heard about Trigger, about Millie and Louie, about Ruby and Beetle, about Cromwell and Bertie, about Fred, Archie, Clemmy, Poppy and Ebony, Winston, Cleo and Rossi, um, and many more in fact, and of course these animals are precious, as all our animals are to their owners, and there is, it, it's a horrible thing when an animal goes missing, but particularly unpleasant if you think that that animal is still alive and suffering somewhere. Um, before I set out the government's position on pet theft, I would first like to set out um, a few 
High-level points on the government's position on animal welfare. Last December, we stood on a particularly strong manifesto for animal welfare, which included commitments to introduce tougher sentences for animal cruelty, crack down on illegal smuggling of dogs and puppies, bring in new laws on animal sentience, end excessively long journeys for slaughter and fattening, banning the keeping of primates as pets, and bringing forward cats microchipping, which is, um, that latter is an issue I campaigned on as a member of the APPG for cats, which obviously Midnight made me join. Um, these measures will build on what's already been achieved. I heard what the Honourable Gentleman opposite said about it may be sensible to bring them together in one bill, and I hope before too long to have some news for him in that regard. In terms of government achievements in this area, in 2018 we did replace old laws on the regulation of pet selling, dog breeding, animal boarding, riding schools and exhibiting animals. And the, the regulations have strict statutory minimum welfare standards which are enforced by local authorities. I'm very excited about the private members bill this Friday, the animal welfare sentencing bill. Um, and this, we hope, if passed, and I very, very much hope it will be, and the government is 100% committed behind it, will increase the custodial maximum penalty for animal cruelty from six months' imprisonment to five years. Um, on microchipping, because that's been rightly brought up by a number of members, and, and microchipping does certainly help. Um, in this sphere, in the sphere of pet theft and, of course, in returning animals to their rightful place. I think um, in, in order to answer my honourable friend from Berwickshire, Roxburgh and Selkirk and the gentleman from South End West who made specific points on dog microchipping, I should say that a review will begin shortly into the effects of the law that was brought in on the microchipping of dogs. Their points are well are well made and I will pass those on and they will have been heard um, today and I'm happy to follow that up specifically. Um, and earlier this year a call for evidence happened on whether to um, increase, uh, um, whether to bring in compulsory microchipping for cats and the responses to that call for evidence were overwhelmingly in favour of bringing in compulsory microchipping. So we'll be publishing a summary of those responses very shortly, and I would very much anticipate we consult on this issue very soon. So going on to pet theft, this is, as has been said by many members, already an uh, offence under the Theft Act 1968, and there are already significant penalties which are possible, they're just, the difficulty is, as so many members across the House have said, is that those penalties are not always used to the maximum. So as we've heard, the maximum penalty is up to seven years imprisonment, and of course that could go even higher if the um, theft occurs, as sadly they sometimes do, as part of an, aggregated, um, an aggravated burglary or robbery. The one difficulty is that we have limited data available to us as to exactly what is happening on the ground. And no, that's, um, I will give way um, briefly. I no, so one of the things that has been touched upon the debate that, I, that I'm aware of has been the uh, smuggling, and whether it be puppy smuggling, whether it be the transfer of dogs between Scotland, Wales and Ireland and Northern Ireland, because there's quite clearly a, a traffic that goes on there. I mean, the, the, the police have stopped some vehicles at the port of Stranraer and have caught people with them. So I just wonder, has there been any contact with the Republic of Ireland? Because we need to have that and regionally as well. Thank you. I, I think the Honourable Gentleman makes an important point, which is that very often pet theft is carried out by criminal gangs mm -hmm. who use yeah. every opportunity to evade justice. Um, if someone causes an animal to suffer in the, in the course of stealing it from its owner, then of course we have recourse to the Animal Welfare Act. Um, and that we very much hope we will have stronger sentencing powers under very shortly if, if we are able to move forward with the private members bill. Um, sentencing, of course, remains a matter for the courts, and when deciding which sentence to impose, the courts should take account of the circumstances of the effect and any mitigating and aggravating factors in line with the guidelines which are issued by the Sentencing Council. In 2016, the Sentencing Council updated its guidelines in relation to sentencing for theft, 
Um, and we, as a department, DEFRA, fed into that review. So the new guidelines set out that the emotional distress and non-monetary value is a factor to be taken into consideration when passing sentence. The, so the impact on the victim is now very much something which the court can and should take into account. I know that the Lord Chancellor um, met with the Honourable Member for Ipswich to discuss this very issue only last week. And I very much welcome the engagement which um, uh, has come about as a, as a result, really, of these petitions in this debate. And I very much look forward to playing my own part in that discussion. We don't think currently that the creation of a specific offence for pet theft is with a two-year custodial penalty would really help much at the moment. We do think that the way to go is to continue the discussions, which I know the Honourable Gentleman is already undertaking, on sentencing guidelines. Um, to this end, the government's very willing to work with interested parties, including the police and animal welfare organisations, to bring this forward. We're keen to act in this area, and I look forward to taking this forward with members across the House. Right, to wind up, Tom Hunt. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. Um, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, and, you know, I think there is sort of cross-party consensus here, which might not be the case for the next debate I lead, which is straight after this debate, but I'm, I'm glad there's, there's one anyway. I, I also forgot to say that I don't currently own a pet myself. Um, I love, because my, my lifestyle doesn't really allow it, um, but I used to own a, 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 another Springer Spaniel owner. I used to own a, an out-of-control Springer called Lucy, who sometimes would just, just run off and you know, spring across into the golf course, and sometimes I wish she wouldn't come back in my, um, in, for some moments, but she always did. She always knew where to come back. And I love to deal it. Um, I think there, there is a, a sense here that this is, as it stands, it's just one way or another it's, it's not working. And one way or another we need to change that. So and I think there is lots of different options and pathways in which we can change that. But one way or another we need to. It is, as Dr. Allen says, it's, it's low risk and it's high reward. If you, uh, if, you, know, we've, you know, we've seen the price of puppies go up, et cetera, et cetera. And if you, you, know, you look and see an example, you know, well, well I may as well do it. The chances of me being caught are very slim. And if I am caught, oh, that chap over there who did it, he got a slap on the wrist and a couple of hundred quid fine. However, if they see that person down the road who did it, they end up in prison for two or three years. I mean, it's just the basics of, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, the basics of having a deterrent, and that would be the case. Um, I, I, I'd also say sort of why now? Because like on the face of it, it might be tempting to think, oh, with COVID-19 and... Brexit and everything else going on, is this really a priority? Absolutely is. Absolutely is a priority. As has been stated by virtually every member here, our pets have never come to a forefront more than right now. And I also think it, something else which is cropping up the agenda right now is mental health. Uh, it was even before COVID, but right now, partly because I think every single person in the country's mental health has been impacted to some degree by this crisis, we are talking about mental health more than ever before. And our pets and our animals are crucial um, to our mental health and our support, and losing them, having them ripped away from us in a way which has been described in so many powerful stories, is incredibly traumatic and harrowing. So I think taking action here to address that is incredibly important. I have had a, as, as um, the Minister referred to, I have had a virtual meeting when I was in lockdown uh, with uh, my right honourable friend, the uh, Lord Chancellor. It was a positive meeting. Um, I'd also point out that those um, who have been behind this petition, um, who I've been in close engagement with, uh, they are pragmatic. Uh, they do have an ideal outcome, but they can still see how getting change in the guidelines in itself would be a major step forward and something to build on. So I've, we are a nation of pet lovers, and we mentioned dogs and and cats, but I've, there's also potential other animals here, parrots, ham, a parrot could be stolen, parrots can be stolen, budgies, guinea pigs potentially, I don't know. And we could go on and on and on. But, but ultimately, I think, I think those, discussions, those discussions need to continue. Those discussions need to continue, and I, I plan to continue to work uh, with the Minister, with the Ministry of Justice, and colleagues who are hopefully will grow in number in terms of more and more of you being interested and wanting to retain that interest going forward. I think this is a very easy thing the government can do, 
uh, to show that they're on the side of the public. We have cross-party consensus. So let's get, let's get some action. Thank you very much. <laughs> Cheers. The question is that this House has considered e-petitions 244530 and 300071 relating to pet theft. As many of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order, order.